and lift off from Frost. the Atlas V with Juno on a trek to Jupiter. Five years after launching from Cape Canaveral, the Juno spacecraft is rocketing at speeds of 165,000 miles per hour towards Jupiter. To reach its destination, a complex engine burn is necessary to slow down and be caught by Jupiter's massive gravitational pull. If the rocket motor didn't burn just at the right time in just the right direction, we were just going to fly right past Jupiter. A decade of planning and execution all comes down to this. I got so nervous waiting for the main engine burn to start, I actually had to stand up. And it felt like for a moment like, like my heart stopped. February 2nd will mark Juno's fourth close flyby over Jovian clouds. This will be the first time that all eight of the spacecraft's science instruments will record and transmit valuable scientific data back to Earth. Juno is currently orbiting Jupiter on a 53-day long journey, facing a constant bombardment of harsh radiation. We're only 5,000 kilometers above the cloud tops. We don't really know what these beautiful zones and belts and swirling clouds look like when you get that close. Juno will whiz by at breakneck speeds, close to 129,000 miles per hour, all while serving as the eyes and even ears of the eager team members back home. Eventually, the craft will perform a new critical burn to shorten its orbital path around Jupiter from 53 days down to 14, increasing both the rate and the amount of scientific data being transmitted back to Earth. And this will reduce our orbital period down to 14 days, which is our science orbit that will continue in for the next 16 months. We'll do that 33 times. We'll make this incredible map of the planet with all our instruments, magnetic map, gravity science map. Every pass is gonna reveal a little bit more about Jupiter that we didn't know before. Every other Wednesday will become science day for the team. But like most things in space travel, nothing should be taken for granted. Technical issues easily fixed at home caused the engine burn planned for October 2016 to be aborted. A small, simple valve is to blame. The malfunction causes a slight delay in the release of the rocket propellant, upsetting the critical ratio of fuel to oxidizer needed for the engine burn. Too much oxygen and the craft will burn too hot, impacting the carefully planned trajectory. After careful deliberation, the maneuver was ultimately scrapped. Will it be attempted during the February flyby? The team must decide whether or not to risk the craft for the sake of science. Jupiter is by far the largest planet in our solar system, leaving Juno with a whole lot of ground to cover. And although it is the second brightest planet in our night sky, its formation and composition have left us in the dark. Previous NASA missions have given us some understanding of its moons, small dust rings, and atmosphere. But we've not been able to see past the Van Gogh-like swirls of dense red brown, yellow, and white clouds that paint the planet. At least, not yet. And all the great, amazing stuff we've discovered about Jupiter is about the moons that orbit the planet, it's about the atmosphere and the enormous weather systems and the great red spot and belts and zones. When we look at Jupiter, we're going, you know, a percent or two of the way down into the planet. That's what we're really seeing. Everything else about Jupiter, the deep interior of Jupiter, is nearly completely unknown. And we have some instruments on, on Juno that are brand new, that we've never sent anywhere. Um, the things that see through the atmosphere. Eight cutting-edge instruments make up Juno's impressive science payload. Three, in particular, will pierce the veil of clouds shrouding Jupiter. The Gravity Science Instrument, 
will be tasked with measuring Jupiter's gravitational and magnetic field by using a relay system of radio signals between the craft and the deep space network. And the orbit of Juno is manipulated by Jupiter's gravity field. It's kind of pushes and pulls on the spacecraft. And so during the communication with these giant antennas, we can measure the Doppler shift, the change in frequency. That basically tells us about how the mass is distributed inside of the planet. The second key instrument on board is the Jovian Infrared Auroral Mapper, which uses an infrared camera and spectrometer to measure Jupiter's auroras, as well as providing thermal imaging data. The most important of these three instruments may perhaps be the microwave radiometer. Able to measure six distinct ranges of thermal radiation, it will be able to peer over 300 miles beneath Jupiter's clouds to create a three-dimensional model of Jupiter's atmospheric environment. But the story would be incomplete without a deeper understanding of what lies at the heart of Jupiter, beyond the swirling clouds. Current modeling estimates that the cloud cover is roughly from gas to liquid as it nears the center, leading to a 24,000 mile deep sea of metallic hydrogen. But the question remains, could they be hiding a rocky core? And if we can probe it and work out the abundance of elements in it, uh, hydrogen, helium, the higher elements as well, and work out roughly what that mix is. It'll tell us something about how, not only how Jupiter was formed, but how the solar system might be. So far, Juno's first three flybys have provided a wealth of scientific data and images that will help formulate new models about the planet. The new perspectives have left team members scratching their heads as they discovered that the North Pole is bluer than the rest of the planet. And home to a large number of storms, including one measuring 4,300 miles across. That's over half the size of Earth. And new infrared views of the poles have revealed warm and hot spots, the likes of which have never before been seen in previous explorations. And while the presence of auroras was already confirmed by the Hubble telescope, Juno has provided the first ever look at the southern auroras. And did you know Jupiter can talk? The craft was able to identify radio and plasma waves transmitting from the auroras, allowing us to listen to Jupiter's siren call. The data from the gravity science instrument is still under analysis, but scientists hope that it will help confirm any one of the current Jupiter formation theories. But to do so, Juno will need to complete dozens of close flybys, making the switch to a 14-day orbit all the more important. If there is a bunch of rocky material in the center of Jupiter, it means that the, in the early solar system, before Jupiter formed, that rocky substances were probably coming together and Jupiter got built around those. It could be um, that Jupiter was built without any of those and that it just collapsed sort of like the sun and there is no rocky material or, or core of heavy elements in the center. Jupiter, because it was the first planet and, and basically used up most of the leftovers after the Sun formed, it really holds the key to the very first step of planetary formation. Like our Sun, Jupiter is made up almost entirely of hydrogen. Had its mass been much, much larger, it could potentially have become a second star in our solar system. And while the storms on Jupiter aren't as violent as the coronal mass ejections that originate from the sun, the Jovian weather is nothing to sneer at. The Great Red Spot is the largest observed storm in our solar system, thought to be at least 150 years old, if not over three centuries. It could swallow our Earth, 
leaving room to spare. Although it appears to be shrinking, a recent Hubble measurement found the moving storm to stretch over 10,000 miles across. Inside, winds blow at speeds thought to be over 400 miles an hour. By comparison, Earth's fastest wind speed was recorded at 253 miles per hour when Cyclone Olivia blew past the coast of Australia. I mean, it looks like a hurricane, but we know it can't work the same way as hurricanes here on the Earth do because those are fed off of the energy from the liquid ocean that's right underneath them. As soon as they go over land, they dissipate. So on Jupiter, they're always over gas and, and giant atmospheres. So they must be feeding off of something very different. I hope to learn how deep that is and learn a lot about what makes those beautiful storms. The scientific data that could one day illuminate the mysterious Great Red Spot may land right here. This is where it all happens where Earth commands are transmitted to the spacecraft and scientific data and engineering telemetry are beamed back down. Only three stations across Earth are able to communicate with Juno, one in Goldstone, California. The other is outside the bustling Spanish capital, Madrid. And finally, right here in the Green Paddies River Valley outside Canberra, Australia. The three locations make up the Deep Space Network. And Juno isn't the only probe in space that the Canberra station is monitoring. The antennas are currently supporting over 45 space missions. We now have a spacecraft around every planet in the solar system. All of them demanding and posing very different sets of challenges. For that reason, the timing standards and antenna accuracy have to be extremely precise. The station is home to two atomic clocks with an accuracy of 10 to the minus 14. But to the layman, what that means is, if I had been born at the beginning of the universe, if I had a digital watch and had set it at that time, then by the time I got to now, 14 billion years, my watch would have moved only one second. That's how accurate the clocks are that we have here. And the timing accuracy is just the beginning. The large antenna behind us is the 70 meter antenna DSS-43. It has a pointing accuracy of six milli-degrees, which is about half the width of a human hair. It takes about 90 minutes for the round trip signal to cross the 500 million miles separating Juno and the deep space network. The signals are very, very low a thousandth or more of the signal strength you would have on the mobile phone. That's why dishes are so big, because it's like a big ear. It needs to use that to capture the signals. So the signals come back, and what we do is we take them and we deconvolve them, digitize them, we turn them into ones and zeros. And those ones and zeros tell us a little bit about the picture or the temperature or whatever it is on the spacecraft. And basically that is then sent back by network back to Pasadena JPL where the scientists then look at them and turn those uh, ones and zeros into images or into real data. I drive to work every morning and I say to myself, I've got to have the coolest job in Australia. So you've got to understand your mathematics. You've got to understand engineering. But also have a little bit of romance in your life as well because it's, it's such a beautiful thing to be able to discover new things about the universe. It's not just NASA scientists who are passionate about discovering Jupiter's secrets. Although the Deep Space Network and JPL are ground zero for the mission, citizen scientists are also able to join in. All they need is a computer and an internet connection. JunoCam, a specially designed imaging camera on the spacecraft, is not counted as one of its scientific instruments. Instead, its sole purpose is encouraging those here on Earth to connect with a probe flying across the solar system. By providing the raw images on the mission website, JunoCam allows users to process those photographs at home. And the results have been nothing short of spectacular. So far, 
Hundreds of sophisticated photos from a global audience have been uploaded, detailing everything from the Great Red Spot to Jupiter's storms and poles. And that's not all. NASA is giving the public unprecedented control over Juno, letting them choose the locations where JunoCam will point to next. Online voting will occur throughout the mission, and images will be snapped during each close flyby. For now, Juno continues on its 53-day orbits, but in the coming weeks, the team may decide to attempt to shorten the orbit to 14 days. But there's a lot to consider. All those involved are collectively holding their breath. The faulty valve, or the intense radiation of Jupiter, continue to hang over the spacecraft's head, threatening to derail the mission. We have a harsh radiation around the Earth, but it's nothing like Jupiter's. Jupiter's is, is maybe a thousand or even a hundred thousand times worse than Earth's. And so a spacecraft that's built to survive it at Earth will only survive a, a split second at Jupiter. And, and in particular, where we're going at Jupiter is the worst of the worst. The magnetic fields surrounding Jupiter can trap high energy particles moving near the speed of light. Should these hit a piece of Juno's elaborate electronic components, they will likely not survive. And it's not just the electronics that are at risk. Scientists and engineers had to consider the possible effects of radiation on all aspects of the craft, from the thermal blankets to the paint. What would kill a person on Earth is about 10,000 rad. What we see at Jupiter over the course of our mission is 20 million rad, because 20 million rad would probably wipe the spacecraft out in one pass. It's basically, Juno's an armored tank. It's got a bunch of armor plating, um, around all of the sensitive electronics and the scientific instruments so that it can survive. A one-eighth inch thick titanium vault is all that's keeping Juno's critical hardware safe from the deadly Jovian radiation. And while it provides a good shield, it does not block out all of the particles, leaving the delicate electronics vulnerable to Jupiter's wrath and in a real emergency, it can shut itself down and only keep its life support systems going, so to speak, the minimum it needs to stay alive and wait for further direction. Uh, it's a very, very smart robot. And while the Juno team has done everything possible to keep their spacecraft safe, nobody could have predicted that a small valve would slow down the amount of science performed during the mission. The team must decide whether to adjust Juno's current orbit allowing them to ramp up the transmission and analysis of scientific data. Will they play it safe and continue on the current slow and steady pace? Or will they risk Juno overheating in the hopes of speeding up the science? It's almost overwhelming and, and dreamlike to be part of this team and realize that we're going to make these very first measurements of what's inside Jupiter and kind of rewrite the textbooks on how not only Jupiter formed, but how the whole solar system came to be and how we got here. 